people in the Discord who want to participate um, vote amongst themselves on what question they would like most to have us answer. And this week's question has a uh, slightly longer version and a short version. I'll read them both. One of the earliest remarks made by Brett in the early IDW days was that humanity is going to need to level up on its understanding of game theory. In coming to understand how game theory can describe and predict outcomes and modes of action, it seems really important to learn to teach children to understand it and how to teach their children to understand it. How would you recommend starting that level up chain with children? Shorter version, can you give concrete examples of what you did to teach your children game theory? Wow. I have, yeah, it's a, it's a great it. question and it's a it's, it's kind a of a doozy of a question. Tough question. Um, but I think actually um, the, the answer that I came up with and I, this, this, when all of this madness with COVID is over, I would love, as we have talked about before, to like devote whole episodes to things that have nothing to do with any of that. And, um, and episodes on how it is that you basically level up children, which, you know, children are in the process of leveling up. That's literally what they're doing. So let's drive uh, SARS-CoV-2 to extinction so we can do that. It's yeah, a great let's, plan. Let's do that. But I mean, I think, I think maybe the best way, and I mean, you may, you may disagree with this. Um, to uh, assure that your children will understand game theory is to let them play without supervision among other children, and a lot of them, and a lot of the time. If there are always adults telling you, telling the children uh, what the rules are, or informing them that that kid's a bully and that kid's not being included, and everyone needs to play and it's it, it needs to follow certain parameters, kids won't learn it. And um, if it's only via formal sport, which is great, you know, we're advocates for formal of, of formal sport, have, have, have played some ourselves, um, but formal sport doesn't, isn't going to teach children the game theory the same way. But a group of three, five, seven, nine kids, uh, hopefully also of somewhat different ages, not all of exactly the same age, you know, not all in fifth grade or eighth grade or first grade or whatever, um, who are, you know, just have some time to explore and to make their own games and to realize that everyone gets out of line sometimes and someone will have an immediate insight into how you bring them back in line. And sometimes that immediate insight is wrong and mean itself and, uh, and who's going to correct the person who was trying to do the correction. And, you know, all of these things are sort of the ways that you see emerging games, you know, get games emerge and then get formed into some kind of shape that actually makes sense. And, you know, some aggregations of kids may always make up a totally different game every time, which I think would suggest to me that they probably haven't, you know, haven't landed on something that actually has the corrective, has the sort of the, the corrective in it. Uh, but if, if you find children starting to revi refine something of their own creation over time, part of what they're doing is they're leveling up their understanding of how to make a functional system. I think those are excellent answers. I would say I do think there's a role here for uh, the use of animations and uh, computer-generated experiences that teach these lessons, which are hard to, I mean, the thing about game theory is the important part of it is, is the counterintuitive part of it. Mm -hmm. And so there, there are ways to demonstrate this um, using, you know, you could use a computer to organize scenarios in which there's something at stake and you have a, a prisoner's dilemma or a race to the bottom scenario where people can recognize that what their expected or their desired outcome is doesn't manifest, even though if everybody else just simply went along with it, it would, right? So experiencing that, that is, in, there's in some ways no substitute. It is also really important to talk to your children about these things because it is possible to learn the lessons without words being applied to them. It's very hard to discuss them with others so that at the point that some game theoretic hazard emerges in a, a, a collective endeavor, you need to be able to talk about, ah, here's, here's what has happened. Here's why it happens. And then here's how we route around it, how we rig the incentive such that the, the failure doesn't occur, something like, like that. Well, I guess I would, I would just add what was in my head, but I didn't say to the model of just letting kids play, like kids always used to play and, and now we're, we're mostly restricting. We're many, many parents and much of society is restricting children from the ability to play. Certainly school is, and many laws are too, um, is 
that saying that there shouldn't be an adult around supervising and 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 micromanaging does not mean that uh, that the adult, the you know, the relevant adult, the parent or whatever, um, shouldn't afterwards say um, you know ask questions and and ask to be included in how that child understands what was happening and in fact help steer their understanding um, such such as they can when it seems necessary. So you know, I think children at different developmental ages. Um, fall into particular kinds of traps in their thinking and um, being able as a parent to say, oh yes, well you saw you know you saw that happen between Mike and Sandra today. Um, my prediction is that's going to keep on happening between Mike and Sandra. How might you um, as you know as an outsider to that dyad, and, you know, believe it or not, we did talk to our children sort of that way, but you know how might you as an outsider to to the two of them, um, you know, help them move past the thing that they're going to keep on getting involved in. And your kid might say, they're not going to keep doing that. Like, okay, let's, you know, let's come back to this in a week or you don't even have to say that. And then, you know, maybe you were wrong, but often you won't have been because adults do have more insight into emerging dynamics between individuals than children will. And being able to come back, having predicted it, having made a prediction to your child and say, oh, so how are Mike and Sandra doing? Oh man, they're still doing that same thing. Remember, I said that they were. I wonder if we can figure out how it is that you might, um, you know, how you might address that, how you might help them get out of the trap that they're in. Um, I'm remembering, I believe it was David Sirach, who was an early participant in Patreon discussions, who was actually in the process of generating some illustrative uh, computer, interactive computer um, programs to show how these game theoretic failures work. Mm -hmm. um, and I should check in with him and see if they're finished and if so, where they are. I would also point out, um, I've been very fond of game theoretic hazards that have been solved and illustrating to children that basically the point is not that the, that the tragedy of the commons is inevitable. In fact, it's not. Eleanor Ostrom's work shows that you can structure things so that it doesn't happen, but mm -hmm. you can't just wish them away. Um, but I, I love the solution, I divide, you choose. Right. Right. Yeah. I divide, you choose is a solution to mm -hmm. a game theoretic problem, and it's elegant. And mm -hmm. so just the recognition that it's not- It's possible that not everyone, so if, if, if you find yourself with one cookie and two people who want the cookie. Right. right. And the idea is, well, the person who divides them is not the person who chooses which one they want. So if, if, if you imagine that the parties are- you know, driven to act selfishly, the person who is doing the dividing has an incentive to get them as even po as possible because to the extent that they are uneven, the chooser will choose the large one. Right. And so anyway, it's just an elegant solution to the puzzle. Well, and it also, I mean, I remember actually conversations with our children about exactly this, um, that that is true. Um, and the cases in which you don't need it is when the desires of the two participants actually run in opposite directions. Like you don't need to simply apply this tool every time you're trying to divide something, yep. only when you both want exactly the same outcome. Right, 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 right. That's true too. Yeah. Um, yeah. So good question. Yeah. And hopefully right. David Sirach has finished his model and then we can have a, an actual tool to deploy in this, yeah. this regard. If it were possible to educate the masses in logic, rhetoric, and scientific methods for decision making, how would that? Um, so we can sort of fill in the rest of the question. Um, well, you know, I think you've got, two, you've got multiple domains of the puzzle, right? How mm. do you make a logical mind? One thing that you and I have been strong advocates about forever is you give the mind direct contact with physical systems um, that basically in which conservation laws apply, in mm -hmm. which you cannot fool yourself into believing that you have understood something when what you have understood is actually false. Right? Both, and, I, and, and what we have said is both in which you are moving your body through the physical world, um, either alone or in group sport, you know, team sports or dance or something, right? And also ones in which you are applying your logic to physical problems where you're trying to solve or build or create physical things in the world. Right. You yeah. cannot Both will- Both of those things, different. You right. cannot will the tower to withstand a force. You cannot um, wish an engine into functioning. You have to understand. Or, or um, claim that you scored a goal when you didn't. Right. Yeah. So- all of these things train the mind to understand how the world actually works yeah. and to the extent that some systems are better models for things that you want to think about, they will also train the mind better. But basically what you want is a mind that is driven to interact with those systems 
like sorting out puzzles within those systems, and that mind will be good. And then the question is, how do you get that capacity to intuit how the world functions, right, to link up with the logical language part that can convey these things, can jockey back and forth with an argument. And, you know, that's kind of the well-rounded version of it. Mm -hmm. um, but it is not to say um, one meets, if you, especially, you know, if you uh, travel to places where you meet a lot more people who work with their hands and, you know, build things and fix things, uh, you meet a lot of people who are incredibly bright, but not necessarily able to say why this thing works. What you see yeah. is the facility with some system. Now, of course, we're a little bit hobbled sometimes in those circumstances to, you know, because there's often a language barrier. But um, nonetheless, I think the key recognition is to recognize that your mind understanding how something works and your conscious mind being able to convey it are two separate things. And really you want, you want both capacities for yeah. Yeah, and let and let them struggle with each other and play off against each other. Yep. Yeah.